I have played every Final Fantasy game except Final Fantasy XI, and that bothers me. I went back to play all the other mainline games in the franchise, so why not XI? Well, it's an MMO, and an old enough one. Created back in 2002 to work both on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox 360, it was last updated in 2018, and I'm more of a single player narrative focused gamer. My introduction to the series was Kingdom Hearts. Final Fantasy X, and I fell in love with the story, the characters, colour, music, gameplay and world, I needed to play more games like it, starting with every other Final Fantasy game. Now, online gaming was not really a thing for my family, especially since we didn't really have a stable internet connection until I was about 16 years old. We never had access to a gaming PC or Xbox, so Final Fantasy XI was totally out of the question. The only MMO I've ever played is Final Fantasy XIV, since at the time it was available on the PlayStation 3. Until then, the only thing I ever played even close to an MMO was PlayStation Home, which was amazing. My brother and I jumped at the opportunity to play, and we delved in deep to Eorzea's world together, and we were totally gripped by its story and characters while also trying to figure out how MMOs were different compared to all the other games we played. So much of the systems, player culture and expectations were still very new to us, so I just stuck to one simple yet daunting goal in Final Fantasy XIV, to experience everything the game had to offer me firsthand. After the release of Endwalker, I can say without a doubt that that was and still is a truly magnificent adventure that will stay with me forever. I had to wonder, could Final Fantasy XI to this day still be a glorious adventure just waiting for me? I had to know. Having wrapped up patch 6.3 and seeing Final Fantasy XI on Steam sale for 10 euro, I think it's time. And once again I'll be diving into this world alongside my brother, hoping to share our new player experience with you all. Our goal was to complete the story of the base game, explore its world and navigate its gameplay as it is in 2023, hoping to have a fun and memorable adventure that could continue on to the expansions. And I was going to do it entirely blind. I'm not going to go into the play online setup, but the moment I heard this music, I was instantly thrown back into the 2000s and shamefully hooked from this point forward. I love the intro cinematic, as brutally pixelated as it was, and I must say, the world seems surprisingly grounded. When you see archers in the midst of battle, you don't see them shoot arrows of light or energy beams, it's just simple arrows. And the antagonists aren't a high-tech empire with a thousand ships at their disposal, but just a stampeding horde of beastmen. I want to talk about character creation because it is both majestic and totally awkward. Seeming like a good idea on paper, it has a preview of each race and how they carry themselves, but it makes it pretty difficult to see my design choices from an overhead view, and the character models in-game do not actually look as good as these. I can't help but laugh at some of the music and posing choices. We're going to leave River Nyx behind for this one, and create a totally fresh new character for this world. Identity theft is not a joke, River Nyx. Dropped right into the city of Sandoria with no guidance from the UI or quest log, I start gathering info the old fashioned way, by talking to every NPC I find, hoping something will happen if I click on people hard enough, just like real life. There was no indication on where the main story takes place, so any time a cutscene played, I just assumed it was a step in the right direction. As I soon found out, this wouldn't be the case. But I didn't mind because I loved exploring the town and seeing whatever events popped up. These are little side quests that take place in each town, but due to all the content inserted into the base game, it can be pretty hard to tell when you're on the wrong track. And plenty of NPCs asking you to buy different things with unique currency, so it can be pretty overwhelming. After some time, I find what I can only describe as the most savage side quest I've ever seen in a video game. You find this kid crying and alone, looking for his dad who went to the shops and didn't come back. 
You find the father gazing at Glamour in the armory shop, with the cashiers gossiping about how this man always leaves his kid behind to check out on his shops. Once you inform the man that his son is waiting for him, you return to the child just in time to see his father arrive. Scold him for being a whiny kid looking for attention whenever the father goes off for a long time. As the kid starts screaming and crying at his father, How could you do this? How can you be so cruel? His father then takes the child's fishing rod and hands it to me as an apology and then abandons his son. Again. If you feel bad like I did, you can secretly open the trade menu and give it back to the kid. There's even a person across the street that mentions they see you give it back to the child. I thought that was pretty cool. After playing child services for a bit, I met up with my adventuring companion, Katala. He suggests we make a move outside to find some orc axe that an officer was looking for. This is where I was introduced to Nation Missions, which are essentially the base game MSQ for each town. Time to roam outside. We took down a few Roman beasts and try to get used to the combat. The biggest enemy in this game is the UI in targeting. It's pretty finicky and slow, taking a while for your character to enter combat stance and attack. You also have to make sure to be in range and facing the enemy, otherwise your turn to attack is skipped. Auto attack is your main offence here, along with job abilities and weapon skills with hefty wait timers. Our first encounter with an orc resulted in a miserable end, where we both died in seconds and I was too busy laughing my ass off to remember to record it. This was our lesson to check enemies before attacking. Checking is a tool that allows you to gauge the enemy's strength before attacking. Revived back in town, Roland Dean gave me a creepy new voodoo doll which appears to disappear on command by clapping. Supposedly he's always with you, allocating a currency called Sparks. You earn these sparks by accepting and completing side objectives. In return for sparks, you get access to a wide selection of leveling gear without the need to spend gil. This has been essential for the new player experience as leveling gear can be extremely expensive, especially on auction. We return to orc hunting after gearing up and we were triumphant. This, in my opinion, is the biggest difference in gameplay from Final Fantasy XIV. The average mobs in the open world and dungeons are strong enough to wipe you out single-handedly if you're careless leading you to fully prepare in town before adventuring outside. Here's where things get interesting, and a bit complicated. After dying to that orc the first time, we were hijacked into a cutscene where a woman stood in front of a crystal with the title Rhapsodies of Vanadil appearing on the screen. I'm still not quite sure I understand it, but supposedly Rhapsodies of Vanadil is a sort of main story quest added into the game in 2015. It guides you to the most important quests, locations, systems and characters in the game and connects them all through a new story quest while also giving you interesting perks, but that's all I really know about so far. Waiting for the orc axe to drop has stumped for a bit as it took a while for the rare item to drop. But then it would disappear from our inventory under certain conditions. I realised later on that we actually had the option to roll for these items, much like you would in 14 duties, except these were open world enemies. Eventually we completed the mission and accepted our next one, which would take us deep into an old king's tomb, our first dungeon. While preparing for the trip we ran into a knight named Horshavon, I mean Eximile, Eximile? And he opened up the trust system, which allowed us to summon story NPCs to fight alongside us throughout the entire game. We can acquire more allies by trading in ciphers to the trust officers and of course I want to trade them all. This system is fantastic and absolutely the deciding factor in us playing the game. Within 5 minutes of the trust combat I could easily see how these guys could carry me all the way to the end of the game and its expansions. Final Fantasy XIV has its own trust system, but imagine if you could summon your favourite MSQ characters like Yuzel or Emmerich or Graha into the open world completing whatever content you wanted. Unfortunately, this system isn't really needed for 14 in the same way, due to the open world not being dangerous enough to warrant the extra help. You do have to resummon them every time you enter a new zone, so that can be awkward but not too bothersome. At the end of this tomb, we found a headstone that triggered a cutscene with a character I've met a few times before. This knight, Roshifon, who up until now I've just called Sir Emmerich, is looking for his queen. Only recently discovering that she had passed away 15 years ago and now he's looking for a sword that may have some clue about her whereabouts. I'm not exactly sure where this is going but I am intrigued. With our nation rank growing higher we've been sent out to a drill training session. And in lieu of training we had to rescue a woeful knight from a cave while every other knight pretended to not know where he is. Apparently this was enough to earn us another rank because the training wasn't gonna be that intensive anyway. We were finally starting to reach high places, gaining access to a previously locked off chateau. 
Our next nation mission order comes directly from Prince Triong, who seems important because he has shiny armor and a room all to himself. Tensions are high between Sandoria and the Beastmen of the Void. After receiving a report on the situation from a scout, we were ordered to infiltrate the Orc encampment in the Void. Upon locating a specific hut, we were introduced to our first instance duty, which, like most early duties in 14, end within a minute, but are still very cool to look at. Prince Triong arrived afterwards to save the day and take the credit, while we ran all the way back to town. You may have noticed our matching attire. From purchasing the game, we can redeem a code for a chocobo shirt and a zerder hat. Wearing these will give heavy buffs to any of our jobs under level 30. But the hat also had an interesting quirk. After learning I could use equipment like items, I clicked on my new hat and it turned me into an egg. I'm not kidding when I say I spent several minutes trapped as an egg, not knowing what to do and being totally baffled by what's happening on my screen. Once I realized I could tab and click on the egg icon, it blossomed me into a beautiful bouncing baby chocobo. Chocobo. I was now a chocobo. My journey here is complete and I can die happy. Apparently, the longer I am being an egg, the faster I am as a chocobo. I never really noticed the difference in speed, but I became a chocobo every chance I got. Striding alongside my allies during long journeys was so cool to watch and so unique to the franchise. We took the long road to Selvina as I was tipped off that the next Rhapsodies of Vanadale quest took place there. The mayor of this coastal town had us hunting wasps for way too long, but we met a fan favourite who gave us a quick unlock for support jobs. Though we couldn't do much with that at the moment, so we just left it there for now. The next direction I was given was to travel to Juno. It seemed a bit too soon to be travelling so far, but apparently that's where the mount system is, so I packed my bags and got geared up. I've heard about the infamous journey to Juno, being an extremely tense and long trek in the vanilla version. I knew it wouldn't be as challenging due to how overpowered our trusts were, but I welcomed the experience nonetheless. My favourite part of games besides the narrative and music is exploring uncharted territory, discovering locations, enemy designs and challenges along the way. As expected, it was a long hike, but not overly difficult, though I freaked out when Catalic charged into this ghastly thing. <laughs> Once we landed in Juno, we took a quick visit to Chocobo Stables, and already our Chocobo has more character and background than the Chocobo we had in 14 for over 10 years. After roaming around for a while, I triggered a cutscene that was unlike most of what I've seen so far. Tensions were pretty high as leaders of each nation were conflicting over laws. I had the feeling we walked into future content a bit too soon, but I was eager to see what happens next, and I had no issue piecing together what info I could get as it comes. I got my full attention when I saw Shintoto appear in view. Even if you haven't played Final Fantasy XI, you probably still know who this is. I'm looking at you, Dissidia. And I was looking forward to seeing if she would actually hold up to expectations. While I was watching this scene, Catala triggered a different type of cutscene in Lower Juno, and requested that I go there immediately. A surprisingly active cutscene plays of townsfolk living their busy yet calm lives in Juno. As I enter the stage, a brilliant light appears in the sky for all in Juno and the Three Nations to see. A wide cast of characters gather in separate locations, trying to understand the light that they are seeing, discussing whether it's a blessing or an omen, potentially staring in the face of an unsettling and unknown world crisis. We also get to see Sid, along with a few other familiar faces from this world. A familiar scene plays out, reminiscent of Final Fantasy X, of an unknown yet powerful child speaking directly to the protagonist as all the town citizens are frozen in place, soon to forget and continue their lives as normal whilst you must carry the burden of knowledge that an unprecedented threat has engaged our peaceful lives. The title Crystalline Prophecy appears overhead which seems to be from the third expansion? I'm not so sure but it was definitely an exciting boost to the story pacing in regards to where I am now. I get the feel that this stage in the story you're supposed to have been well acquainted with the world and this disruptive event shatters whatever peace the player thought they had. After that dramatic shift in the narrative, I'd say now is the perfect time to end this video. My biggest compliment to this game is that I can go from 0 to 100 very quickly. The dialogue is snappy to read, not too much bloat, the characters are interesting but their goals and motivations aren't quite clear yet. The music is fantastic. It's often triumphant and glorious but slaps hard on cutscenes with a darker tone. I love how similar this game feels to Final Fantasy X and XII while also having the skeleton of what became XIV Online. The open world is expansive but on the obscenely large side and short draw distances that make travelling with others pretty messy. 
combat is slow and uneventful at the moment, but it's fun to watch it play out, just as I love watching the Gambit system play out in 12. The user interface is pretty rough and slow to navigate. But overall, I am loving my time so far and really looking forward to seeing more. And that's it for me. Like and share this video if you found this new player experience at all interesting. And subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like these. And this is my first time doing voiceover, I hope it wasn't too bad. Till next time, bye bye!